arrived in the Philippines about five years ago on a short-term um, assignment to write business and investment reports on this country. One day, one of the men I was interviewing, he called me a parachute journalist. I said, what's a parachute journalist? He says, yeah, you're one of these foreigners, you come to our country, you write a quick report, and then you leave. You don't really understand the Philippines. I thought, how dare you? I studied at a top university in Europe, and these reports go into prestigious international magazines. I thought, you know what, I'm going to show these Filipinos that I really do understand your country. So what did I do? The next day, I went to Green Hills, and I bought the finest Barong Tagalog I could find. And the following day, I showed up at my interview, and I expected the gentleman I was interviewing to be very impressed with my new attire. He said, after about two minutes, he looked at me, a slightly confused and concerned look on his face. He said, but sir, you do realize, if you wear a Barong Tagalog, you really should wear an undergarment. So imagine, air conditioning on max, there I am in this beautifully embroidered and yet rather transparent Barong Tagalog. In fact, don't imagine it too much. Now, after that day, I decided never to wear a Barong Tagalog again. So I was this guy. I was dressed in a suit, and I was interviewing other people in suits or Barongs all across Metro Manila. I was going from the business districts to Malacanang. One day, on the way to Malacanang, I was on Rojas Boulevard, stopped at traffic lights, and some kids looked inside the window, and they saw something of interest. Americano, they said. As I was composing myself once more, some other kids started tapping on the window and calling me Joe. Now, I, thought, I was a bit confused. I thought, maybe there's some case of mistaken identity here. So I said to the driver, I said, can I wind down the window and tell these kids that I'm neither Joe nor Americano? I'm Tom from England. The way he responded to me was very revealing. He said, oh, sir. I don't recommend you do that. If you wind down your window, these kids will probably rob you. So I didn't wind down the window, and I went back that evening to my 34th floor condominium in Salcedo Village. But I had this thought in my head. I said, why would anyone bother reading my reports if I'm that disconnected from the ground? I'd had enough of writing these kind of false reports, and I wanted to really write a report which told a more authentic story of this country and a story which would give me hope. So, people started telling me, you've got to meet this guy. Now, this is Tony Maloto. If you're not familiar with who Tony Maloto is, I'm sure you are familiar with the organization that he started, Goward Kalinga. So, I did a bit of research on GK. I fixed up an interview, expected it to last about 30 minutes. Three hours later, I'm staring back at this clipboard of questions, and Tony had challenged me to see this country in an entirely different light. In particular, he said, Tom, you talk a lot about inclusive growth, the only way we're going to achieve an inclusive growth in this country is if we unleash the genius of the Filipino poor. The genius of the poor? If there's genius in the poor, then why are they poor? It didn't make sense. Tony said to me, don't take my word for it. Go and discover it for yourself. It's time you ditched that shirt and tie. So I thought about it for a short while, and I thought, okay. So I spent one year living in the communities of Goward Kalinga. And that journey, it was a life-changing journey for me. And there's two key reasons why this one-year journey had such a major impression on me. The first is Bayanihan. And let me tell you how I first discovered what Bayanihan was. So remember I had that car and a driver. I had to give all of that up, and I had to start taking jeepneys. About it. What could possibly go wrong if a Brit takes a jeepney for the first time? I've already messed up with the Barong Tagalog, right? What could go wrong? Maybe you think I don't know where the jeepney's going. But don't you worry, I did my research. I learned the words Ibabao and Ilalim. I learned other words. I learned Bayadpo. I even learned Padapo. And the strangest thing for me, which I learned coming from London, was that if the driver can't hear you when you say Padapo, you have to start whacking the roof. Very strange. Anyway, I thought I was well prepared. And my baptism of fire for taking jeepneys, my very first jeepney experience was along Commonwealth Avenue. In case you're not familiar, this is eight lanes of pure chaos, the highway of hell. So I stopped the jeepney, 
And you may think I'm quite tall, so I probably I couldn't find a comfortable seat, but I was okay. I found a nice little seat squished be between a couple of plump teeters at the back. So it's actually quite comfy. And then after about a minute, I thought, oh, I haven't paid it yet. I did what any Brit would do in that situation. I'm sat at the back, got a backpack on, and I jump up. And then I turn around. And as I turn around, I whack the teeter in the face with my bag. And then we're going about 40 miles an hour right now along the highway of hell. And I'm making my way from the back all the way to the front, treading on people's toes, whacking someone else in the face. And I promise to get to the driver at the front. And don't worry, I remembered my line. I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Bayad Paul. That driver looks around a bit confused. But anyway, I give him 10 pesos, he gives me two pesos change, and then I, what happens? I have to go all the way back. So I finally make my way to the back of the jeepney, and I have the impression I am the least popular person in the history of taking jeepneys ever to take a jeepney. But I'm looking back at everyone else in the jeepney thinking, you know what, it's not my fault, it's a stupid system. In London, we have an electronic card, we pay the driver, it's so easy and it's safe. A moment later, another lady gets on, <coughs> sits opposite me. And I'm thinking to myself, you know what? She is going to have exactly the same problem I had. And then she did something which surprised me. She got so bad for. She picked out 10 pesos from her pocket. Passed it to the person next to her. And that person passed it to the person next to them. I'm watching this thinking, oh, so that is how you do it in the Philippines. Because, of course, it's possible to pay for a jeepney on your own. I mean, I managed it, but it's a lot easier if you do it together, right? And this is the spirit of Bayanihan, how I first discovered it. You know, if I think back to that first interview with uh, Tony Maloto, he said to me, the Philippines has no excuse to be poor. And I thought, of course it has a lot of excuses to be poor. It has health problems, infrastructure, education, corruption. I could go on and on and on. And yet today, I know he's absolutely right. Because we don't have that spirit of Bayanihan in the UK. You guys have it. It's beautiful. And yet there's so much inequality. But what's more, I saw in the communities of Gaud Kaling that I visited, I saw how slums really were being transformed, one community at a time, into colorful and peaceful communities like this. So that's the first value, by any hand. The second is walang iwanan. Now, when I first came across this expression, I checked it out in the dictionary, and I was like, okay, no one left behind. Okay, that makes sense, I can understand that. But it took several months until I fully grasped what walang iwanan means. So it's towards the end of my one-year journey in these communities, it was Christmas time, and a major typhoon had just struck the Philippines. And I was stuck on an island in one of the affected areas, all on my own. And all of my family and my friends had gone back to Europe. My Filipino fr friends, of course, were with their families. So for the first time in my journey, I felt a little bit left behind. So I asked a friend, I said, what can I do this Christmas time? It was Christmas Eve. He said, why don't you go to the local GK village? And I thought, well, okay, it's better than being on my own at Christmas time. I wasn't super excited about it, I've got to be honest. I was feeling a bit miserable. He said, don't you worry, I'm going to sort it out. So, I don't know, he had a uh, globe, and he sent a message to the community that had smart or sun, uh, I, I can't remember which one. And probably because the typhoon had struck, that message never got there. So I jump on the back of a Habble Habble, or a motorbike, and I make my way from the touristy area of the island to the far side of the island. And I jump off the Habble Habble at about 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Merry Christmas, guys! Now, one of the first expressions I learned in the Philippines when I arrived here was, no speed, bro, no speed. You can imagine the situation. There was three or four minutes of panic. Like, where did this guy come from? Why is he not with his family? What do we do with him now? And the Kapit Bahayan president of that community, he came up to me and he said, Tom, we weren't going to celebrate Christmas this year. We lost everything in the typhoon. But now you're here, we're going to make a party. So 
There was one gentleman in the community, he was a fisherman. Earlier that day, he had caught a squid. So he put the squid on the barbecue. He had another guy, he had a Nokia phone, not a smartphone, but one from like 2001, and it played music. That was the important thing. And he said, don't you worry, sir, I be DJ. And we had someone else, there was no power in the community, right? But we had someone with a flashlight. And he spent three hours flashing on off, on off, on off, on off, on off. And it was the disco lighting. And this was me. Christmas Eve in Bantayan Island in Cebu. This was before the Tanduai came out. It really is more fun in the Philippines, right? If you can create so much fun out of so little resources. And it was so much more than that. Because that night, I went to sleep in one of the community houses. And I was sleeping in a, in a, in a Kawakalinga house. So it was, the, the bed was not the mattress I was used to, of course. It was a plank of wood. But unfortunately, this plank of wood hadn't been cut for Caucasian dimensions. What does that mean? It was too short. So there I am, trying to sleep on this plank of wood, and my legs are dangling off the end. And after a couple of minutes, I start, a couple of hours, I started to feel a bit sorry for myself again. I thought, you know what? I should have just stayed in a resort tonight. I'd be so much more comfortable. And I, thought, I, I went to the CR. And on the way to the CR in that household, I saw the mother and father lying on the floor. back to the room and I looked up and I realized I couldn't see the stars. Now why was that significant? Because I was in the only house in the entire community that still had a roof. So I was in the best house in the community and I was sleeping in the matrimonial bed of the best house in the community. And for the next two hours I couldn't sleep either. And not because I was physically uncomfortable, I was very emotionally challenged by these people. And it got me thinking, if someone is to show up on my doorstep, on Christmas Eve from a faraway country in the east and say, hey, can I come in? Can I have dinner with you tonight? And can I sleep in your bed, by the way? What would I do? I'd say, I don't know you. I don't owe you anything. I'd give them a mince pie. That's what we give at Christmas. And then I'd say, on your way. And if I didn't leave, I might well call the police. It's the reality. This situation challenged me to become a better version of myself. Because I learned what Walang Iwanan meant. Because Walang Iwanan, from the translation, meant me as a relatively rich person giving a little bit of what I have to the poor. This community had nothing. And yet in that moment, that one moment of my journey where I was left behind, it gave me everything that they possibly could at that moment. So these stories are in the book I wrote, The Genius of the Poor. And we published that book, it was time to get back to reality. I had to get a pension plan, I had to get a serious job, and I had to go back to London. And you know what? If I had stayed any longer in London, I would have probably got depressed. Where was the Walangi Wanan, the Bayani Han, the genius of the poor in London? I couldn't access it, and I was getting sad. You know what English people do when we get sad? We go to the pub. So I was down the pub, I was drinking beer, and there was one particular day I was drinking probably on pint number three or four, and I was getting increasingly emotional about my time in the Philippines. I was starting to sound like Tito Tony himself. My friend, he put his arm around my shoulder and he said, look, Tom, if it really makes you feel any better, I will double my subscription to OnlyFans. It was a pretty severe offer. And yet, it made me realize, I didn't want him to double his subscription. I didn't want him to do more. I didn't want him just to listen to my stories or to read my book. I want him to come and experience the genius of these communities for himself. So that's where I got my next idea. I thought, I'm going to set up a social tourism platform, Mad Travel. We're going to create fun and fulfilling experiences in Gawakalinga communities and other communities all across the Philippines. Not just for foreigners, let me say. Because just like the butterfly, who perhaps doesn't know quite how beautiful his own wings are, I wonder if it's time that Filipinos themselves are reminded of the potential for genius all around you.